Um, I wanted to welcome you all. I, I, I haven't met you. Um, I'm, I'm Cynthia Cutting. I'm the director of the Museum of the White Mountains and very pleased to be hosting tonight's event um, and talk. And um, it's great to see your faces, as I said, and to welcome new faces um, to this group. Um, thank you. Uh, some of you are members of the museum, and I really um, am so grateful to our members, especially at this time. Um, having our support for our membership is, is going to carry us through, and we will hopefully reopen with a smash opening for um, the Maps of the White Mountains, which is co-curated by um, Adam Apt here this evening. Um, so we're really hoping that's going to happen um, in May this year, crossing all fingers and toes, um, along with everyone else around the world, that things begin to make th things like that possible. So um, thank you to members and thank you all for being here this evening. Um, before we, I introduce our speaker, I just wanted to give you a little housekeeping things for those of you who don't Zoom as much as I'm doing every day. <laughs> ah! um, so just, um, uh, you'll be muted for, for during the talk, um, but at the close we'll be, be opening up to questions. But as we go through, um, as Becky is speaking this evening, if you'd like to add a question, you can add it to the chat um, down at the bottom of your screen. Click on it and just um, type in your question and Rebecca will be um, helping to raise those questions at the end of, of the evening, um, which will be fun. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome and thank um, Becky Fullerton for joining us this evening and leading this um, wonderful talk. Um, Becky, as many of you know, is the archivist of the Appalachian Mountain Club, uh, based out of a the AMC Highland Center at Crawford Notch. She is a self-professed history nerd, I love that, <laughs> a, a trail runner and a White Mountain landscape painter. Um, Becky has been a good friend of the museum for many, many years, and we are so grateful to have her here um, at this time. And um, thank you so much, Becky, and take it away. All right. Thank you all so much for having me. Thanks again to the Museum of the White Mountains for having me as a speaker. And I'm thrilled to be part of the Mountain Voices lecture series. If you didn't catch Marcia Schmidt Blaine's lecture, uh, well, she was doing that last month that you should go and see the recording on the museum's website because it was great. And I know for a fact that Dave Gavatsky's lecture on uh, early conservation movement next month is going to be amazing too. So try to catch that as well. But tonight I'm going to be presenting to you excerpts from three hiker journals from 1910 to the 1920s. And they're pretty extensive excerpts. All three of these writers um, were folks that traveled in and hiked in the White Mountains regularly. I'm going to read one by a young woman from Rhode Island who in 1910 took a multi-night trip through Carter Notch. And then there's a uh, epic 20-day hike from the Adirondacks to the White Mountains by uh, a group of AMC folks from 1923 that is just hilarious and amazing and uh, just totally gets me. And then finally, a, a, a Dartmouth student from 1929 who goes on a little Thanksgiving uh, expedition with some of his friends and they have many misadventures and it, uh, that one definitely gives me chills. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, let's see. That and that and that. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Excellent, I can't believe I got that on the first try. <laughs> Uh, so all of these, I'm going to illustrate this talk with images. The, the first journal is, is simply a, a handwritten manuscript, so the author of this didn't include any images or photos. The second journal um, actually had tons of photographs pasted right into it, so I'll be sharing the photos that go along with the writer's own text. And then the third one had some images, but not very many. So I'll be using photos that were from the same approximate time and place as the author's own writing to illustrate. And I'm going to jump right in 
with our first excerpt, which is by a young woman named Grace Harris Hoff. She traveled to the White Mountains in 1910 as part of AMC's oldest tradition, which is known as August Camp. This is a roving two section, two week camping trip. They used to go to the White Mountains in Maine quite a lot, but now they travel out west. Um, we've had the camp up in Canada and the, the Rockies wanders around. But in 1910, it was in the Great Gulf in the White Mountains. And Grace participated in this, but she also went off with this little splinter group of hikers and they traversed Carter Notch over two nights. Uh, and this is her story. She is from Bristol, Rhode Island. She went to the Women's College of Brown University. Her family is part of a, um, a huge yacht building company. If anybody knows anything about yachts, uh, you may have heard of Harris Hoff Yachts. Uh, she would go on to be very, very interested in insects and study and write about them. She actually has both a moth and a fly named for her. Uh, and her writing is very detailed, uh, inquisitive, and she waxes poetic quite a lot. And um, I love her for all of those things. So this is her story. Starts off on Tuesday, August 9. And she tells us exactly how many miles she goes every day. She, uh, this is part of all of her little details. Uh, Tuesday, August 9th, nine miles. Wonderful, clear day and miles. Beautiful cumulus clouds, but piling up like forerunners of a storm. Started late after 10 a.m. for Carter Mariah trip. Six of us, LW, Mr. Hunt, Mr. Taylor, Bob Bonnie, Bickford, and Self. Reached Glen about noon, got six loaves of bread, also some milk, slightly sour, and a little lettuce. We then had a copious lunch under the trees by the spring. Starting across in front of the Glen House for a leisurely trip into the Notch, we took the shortcut along the pipeline and broke to the lumber yard. The trail was not very wet, wet, but it was fairly steep in spots, especially just before reaching the divide. This last bit was really pretty, and we looked up high on the right to the top of Wildcat and back through the Notch to Blue Sky in the north. The western sky was growing white with cloud. It was a very hot trip with our heavy packs and we stopped frequently and refreshed ourselves at the many brook crossings. Walking in pleasant company at the time passed unperceived and it was after 4 p.m. when we arrived. After dropping in the winding trail down the divide, the lake and camp came into sight looking charmingly wild and beautiful. The spring is on the trail before one reaches the camp. Here lie these two lakes, separated by a tumbled mass of rock, which once slid from the mountain wall. The upper, surrounded with spruces to its very edge, with lilies covering half its black placid surface. surface. The lower, dammed on the south with rough rocks, a few of which have fallen into the midst of it, of it lies brown and remote. Clouds had gathered on our arrival and darkened the waters, which were already somber, imprisoned between these two great forested mountain walls. At the lower lake, we found a tiny sand beach on the west side, sheltered by a mossy rock, where all took turns bathing. It was pretty cool and damp with a, quite a breeze, and we were glad to busy ourselves about the campfire, which we built outside by the rock. Later, we, we kindled the fire inside, which, of course, smoked. Our supper was comforting. Bacon, toast, fried potatoes, donuts, cheese sandwiches, and cocoa. We had only one pail and fry pan, but found a coffee pot. A note on food. For six, uh, three days less breakfast. One loaf of bread per meal was ample, but one slice of bacon apiece, and only three meals of it was not sufficient. One pound of butter was right for seven meals, but we used cheese on our bread a good deal and had some sandwiches for two dinners, all prepared. Bacon is necessary in cooking for sake of the fat to fry in. For breakfast, we had cereal, one package cream of wheat, 
coffee, toast, donuts, bacon. She likes bacon a lot, I can tell. Used true milk, of which we had two cans. It is excellent. Buckwheat for flapjacks with plenty of sugar would be good to take and not heavy. For lunch that day, we had sardines, hardtack, bread, and odds and ends of lunch prepared at camp. That night, night soup was the staple with cheese sandwiches, toast, cocoa, remains of fruit. There was no bacon, as we are saving it for breakfast, but we could have eaten more. The last breakfast was the same as that of the second day. Our last real meal, dinner, we ate nearly everything left. Sardines, soups, breads, donuts, saving hardtack and chocolate for the carriage road. To continue, we sat on the piazza late in the eve, the fog rolling in around us so that only the nearest treetops rose from the ghostly mist. It was chilly and a bit gruesome with all that cloud wrapping us in the narrow valley, frowned over by the mountain walls, one new hemmed us in, but I was happy out there. Wednesday, August 10, eight and a quarter miles, Carter Notch Camp to Imp over Carter's. Got breakfast from seven to eight, rather leisurely, and got away between 9.40 and 10. Everything was moist and green and vapory and gray. And though the air was chill, it was not very easy to climb. The first 800 feet up Carter Dome is very steep, but taken slowly is not hard. The woods are lovely. Following through pretty woods and wet spruce woods, the green was daintily frosted by the drops of moisture all along the ridge that day. We struck the burn. A ghostly, ghastly sight in the low clouds with the twisted, writhing limbs swinging out of the mist while the cold wind soughed in a dreary way over the low tops. And very soon we were on the summit of the dome. So this is evidence of, I think, the 1907 um, fire that burned over much of the Carter Range. The summit is marked by a tripod, and here we registered, then turned down and found ourselves in an even greater desolation on a very steep where the first scrub was charred. Another steep pitch brought us to the summit of height, bare windswept rock with every trace of vegetation burned away. We registered here, shivering in the damp wind, which was now strong. Next, we descended a long distance and walked for some time in pretty woods, sheltered from the wind and out of sight of the burn. Finding ourselves in a pretty green coal with a spring, soon after 12, we stopped for lunch about one hour and built a small fire just for fun. It soon began to rain and drizzled the rest of the afternoon. Again, we mounted now through wood all the way and passed over the undulations of the ridge. Finally, we were on the wooded ridge of North Carter and thence a very steep and scrambling descent led down into the coal paralyzed in the camp. A little way down and jumping the steep rocks, I gave my ankle a bad twist. Bob helped me all the way down, but I was tired and lame when we reached the camp. It was then 4.20 p.m. and really raining. Changing foot gear, we festooned the wet things in front of the fire, which Bick soon had blazing finally, as there is a splendid draft. The rock in front of the open shelter forms an angle, making an excellent chimney, leading the smoke up above the roof of the shack. After repairing the depredations made by porcupines on the roof, and sorting our belongings, we spread ourselves all over the place and started what seemed, thanks to the rain and our limited quarters, very messy preparations for supper. That meal was well underway when a war whoop announced the arrival of four soaking men with large wet packs. We made room for them and they provided us with some amusement, though they made quarters for the night decidedly crowded. Vic kept up the fire well. Every once in a while, I would see a blaze up and light our faces with its brightness, and it kept the place very warm. I slept long enough to dream I was a ginger snap standing on end. 
Thursday, August 12, 12 and a quarter miles, imp camp to camp in Great Gulf. At 6 a.m. I rose and went out into the silent dripping forest where the green shone with added color and luster from the moisture. White mist still hung in the distance. Breakfast was about 9 a.m. and we started at 10. Presently, the heavy mists broke and a great blue ridge was thrust silently into the midst of the white, part of the presidential range. After we had passed the Mount, summit of Mount Surprise and were in thick woods, a very heavy shower came up and soaked us till we reached Gorham at 3 or 3.30. Now we could look back and see the ridge we had traversed the last two days, softened by the afternoon haze. We left Gorham about 4.30, driving to Glen, and found, of course, clouds lying over the Great Gulf. We left Glen at 6.40. It was darkish on the carriage road and soon showered, but later the stars came out in velvet blue and a pale sliver of moon gleamed a little while in the west. It was not hard walking, but rather pleasant in the dark where we could barely see 20 feet ahead, but above very clearly the stars. At 8.30, we reached Halfway House, ate chocolate and hardtack, met guide with two lanterns and started down the telephone wire, reaching camp in one hour at 9.40, hungry and happy, a trifle damp, but not too tired uh, to drive for an hour beside the blazing fire. Friday, August 12, one and a half miles to Great Gulf Camp and return for lunch. A wonderful mountain day, wind northwest, warmish, a few high cumulus clouds, bathed joyfully in the brook, which felt clear and soft against the cooled flesh. The rocks warmed by the morning sun were pleasant to lie on. Packed all the morning, then about noon, we went up to Great Gulf Camp for a picnic lunch with quite a crowd. Returned in 20 minutes, about 2.30, and took several photos around camp. Later, paddled in the brook. Then L and I lay on the rocks to watch the clean white clouds float over. Always the river rushed on steadily, white over the rocks, greenish brown in the shallows. The air chilled. The skyline grew clearer and its beauty cut like a sword, for it was our last night in camp. That evening we sat till midnight by the happy blazing fire. The stars shone very clear and bright overhead and the living heat gleamed white hot in the fire's heart. So that's Grace and her story. Um, just such a wonderful observation um, of being out in the wilderness with um, friends and, and other members of AMC and uh, just a, a really wonderful writer. Her journals span about uh, a decade from 1906 up to about 1916 or 17 and then they abruptly end. Um, so there's a lot more of her in the archives. So this next one, this is a uh, this is an amazing epic trip called uh, what, what we used to call a long range walk or a range walk. Uh, or a wilderness tramp was the other term that they used for it. Um, and this party consisting of uh, maybe 10 people and then they had another person join them kind of halfway, walked from Lake Placid to Cold River Camp. So from the Adirondacks all the way over to the White Mountains. Um, they, uh, they took a ferry across Lake Champlain at some point and they hopped in a couple of cars for a section of this too but they uh, all in all they walked over 140 miles in 21 days 40,000 feet of elevation gain and they spent only one night in a hotel. Uh, one of the members of the party is Walter Collins O'Kane who is an author. I don't know who wrote this journal but I'm I I would love it for it to have been him, but I, I don't think that it is. I think he is referred to as the boss in this uh, journal. Everybody has little nicknames and um, funny foibles and stuff like that. So it is uh, quite amusing. So this is the list uh, of who was on this trip or the, uh, the personnel, as you can see here. Um, 
quite a little crowd of folks. You can see WCO Kane is on there too. Um, and lots of women as well. So uh, the journal begins Saturday morning, August 18. We blew into Lake Placid Station a bit after 10, daylight savings. Marie Stevens had arranged for breakfast at a hotel, but the landlady said we were too late and wouldn't feed us. A garage man telephoned to a boarding house and succeeded in getting us our breakfast. Unholy news, the duffel bags checked with our tickets didn't arrive with us. The only thing to do was to wait for the next train. At three o'clock, the next train from downstate came in and the duffel bags were aboard. Monday, August 20, brought a clear, fine morning. We ate breakfast early and set out for McIntyre, crossing the dam at the, the foot of Lake Colton, climbing the skimpy ladder at its farther end and following the trail along the margin of the lake. Then we took a trail next to a stream bed and began to climb Mount McIntyre. Higher up again, we looked back through an opening in the trees at the great range of the Adirondacks, an alluring view. In front of us was the panorama, beginning with Marcy on the right and filling jagged skyline to the wolf's jaws, way off to the left. We climbed to the top and stayed there for a time, but the wind was growing colder. In the lee of some big rocks, we warded ourselves in a patch of sunlight and greased our shoes. Presently, it became cloudy and threatened storm, so we turned back for camp. As we reached the shelter, the rain began. We ate our supper in the midst of a shower. Gladys Boyce and I helped buck up some firewood with a crosscut saw. There was rice pudding for dessert at supper. We cooked enough of it, theoretically, to have some left over for rice cakes in the morning. But Murray Stevens ate it all up, every bit that was left. He sat on a stump with a pale catty corner across his knees like the bears in Yellowstone. Thursday, August 23, was a regular winter morning. The night before, a few had climbed the cone of Mount Skylight before supper. They had just managed to make the summit as the clouds shut in. This morning, some of the rest of us climbed the cone before breakfast and saw the sun send shafts of light through the mists over the ranges to the east. It was beautiful, but it was cold. Near the summit, we found little spruces and tufts of grass coated with frost feathers. On some of the rocks, there were films of ice. At nine, we started from the hut and climbed the cone of Mount Marcy, rising a thousand feet higher. It was a great day after the stormy weather that had preceded it. On the summer, summit, we loafed about, enjoying gorgeous views in every direction. In spite of freezing and thawing, climbing and crawling, we were whole and sound on the top of the highest point in the Adirondacks. Friday, August 24, was a day of strenuous climbing experiences and gorgeous mountain views. From our camp at Haystack Brook, we climbed the side of Basin Mountain, part of the way by an exceedingly steep trail. It was slow going. One could not move rapidly or keep at it continuously. But we, when we came out on the summit basin, we had before us one of the most beautiful views of the whole trip. With Panther Gorge at our feet, Marcy across it, skylight to our left with Haystack across the valley, with Saddleback and Gothics to the east. We descended Basin Mountain by another steep trail and finally wound up at a cliff where a 50-foot rope had been tied in place to help you down. One by one, each in his own way, we descended the rope, some right side up, some more or less upside down. We pitched camp at the coal, using an old campsite for our fireplace. This was the evening of casualties. About supper time, it began to rain. It grew cold and Mrs. Mack sought advice as to the bad ankle, which began to tune up. We gave her a tube of balm out of the dill tobacco box and told her to rub it in until it was gone, the balm or the pain or both. Two others confessed to lame knees, still another a lame ankle. 
Mabel Ainsley took hold of a sharp knife at the wrong end and cut her finger. The boss found a new way to cut down on weight out of his outfit by discarding the stem of his pipe and carrying only the business end. An awful crank on weight, the boss. Tonight for supper, Vienna sausages. Six cans, 10 to a can, none left. Monday, August 27, we returned to civilization by way of Ossible Chasm. We went through the chasm along with the gangs of tourists, most of whom probably thought that we looked like a rough crew. For that matter, they didn't meet our approval either. Then the auto toted us down to the landing at Fort Kent. Shortly after we arrived, there was a steamer that drew near and we found that it was bound for Plattsburgh then back to Port Kent and then to Burlington. Most of us hustled on board for the extra ride to Plattsburgh and back. Murray Stevens, out swimming in the waters of the lake, thought that the boat was bound immediately for Burlington and started to swim across the lake after the boat. Tuesday, August 28, we set out for the Green Mountains. It was raining still as we disembarked from our bus ride out of Burlington. So we started out under ponchos, but pretty soon the downpour stopped and we had pleasant enough going. At the site of the old halfway house, we cooked a lunch. Edna Gillette endeavored to throw a bottle away, but busted it on a tree, pl right plumb in front of her. After lunch, we went up trail rather steeply for a time. As we climbed up the upper edge of the forest, we found a rabbit sitting snugly beside the trail. We took his picture while he obligingly waited. We crossed under the chin and in mid-afternoon dropped our packs at Taft Lodge. Several girls and boys were there before us. So this is proof that they did see that rabbit. Um, you can see him tucked up into the uh, underbrush in there. Thursday, August 30, a chorus of young youngsters woke those in the lodge before 5 a.m. Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, supposedly, but not very far along in scoutdom. We were up all up early and saw a beautiful sunrise. The valley to the east filled with a lake of clouds. We had a comfortable breakfast in the sunny morning air in front of the lodge. We visited the Summit House for a few minutes, then set off for the trail to the Trout Club. It was a long grind before lunch. We needed water and there wasn't any. We started out over the red blazed cutoff trail, discovered that it climbed instead of going down, retraced our weary steps, and finally cooked lunch at a brook on the old Trout Club Trail. Friday morning, August 31, we left the Trout Club in two autos, a Dodge and a swell looking Packard, a swift ride of a hundred miles with a wild driver in the Dodge and an ambitious running mate in the Packard. We stopped at Littleton for dinner and uh, at, a, at a hotel, memorable in part because Murray Stevens didn't know that seconds on pie were allowable. At the end of our ride, we disembarked at the foot of the trail that leads up North Kinsman. We went half a mile up the trail and camped pitching our tents along a terrace where horses came to wonder at us from a distance, but obediently left at the wave of a hand. A good fire, good water, so hard to lug it up the hill through the woods. A good night's rest. Saturday morning, September 1, we started up North Kinsman. It seemed like a hard climb after our day of luxury, but there are always diversions. To wit, Edna Gillette has an aluminum pan that is in a class by itself. It has become so kinked and folded that you need a toothbrush to wash it. Murray Stevens' shoes are giving out. They were new at the start, $12 shoes marked down to $7.50. Also his pants. He has begun to wear the tail of his shirt outside as a sort of drop curtain. Sunday morning, September 2, was foggy and windy. In the late afternoon, we made the shelter at Gio, the slopingest, slantingest country and the slantingest shelter in the White Mountains, not even accepting the one at Mount Resolution on the Davis Trail. 
It rained a little in the evening, making our fire seal, feel sad. We ate supper in the dark, except for a faltering candle. Mrs. Mack finally located and retrieved an open safety pin, which had traveled a long and painful journey all day and had repeatedly refused to be caught. Murray Stevens, going to sleep in his poncho tent with feet downhill on the persistent slope, found himself in the morning about to invade the dock's rabbit hutch tent, feet first. Tuesday, September 4, was a day of beautiful views. As we looked out from the shelter at Gio, white clouds with the sun shining brightly on them were sweeping up from the valley. We tramped on to the top of Bond and then looked back at the splendid panorama of mountains and clouds. To the southwest, we overlooked the ledges of Bond. To the west were the Franconias. To the east, the bulk of Carrigan was swept with clouds. To the north, the sun of Mount Washington, this great sea of white. Friday, September 7, from our camp this morning, we looked out at a gorgeous sunrise behind the peak of Mark Baldface. There was hash for breakfast, hash made out of the one boiler that, boiler that had failed to disappear the night before. Breakfast was over, we packed up, including the one remaining pie, they got pie along the way somewhere here, and set out down the Wild River Trail. We climbed the link trail up North Baldface. Below the cone, we stopped for 10 or 15 minutes to pick blueberries. The clouds began pouring over Eagle Crag to the Northeast. So we hurried on up the top of the cone, down to Eagle Crag, and on down the trail a mile or so until we came to water. We cooked lunch and ate the pie. At four o'clock in the afternoon, we emerged from the Bald Face Circle Trail. A few minutes later, we dumped our packs on the piazza of Cold River Camp. So 140 miles, 21 days, uh, a crazy adventure for our wilderness trampers. So this last one um, is kind of perfect for this fall, starting to feel a little bit like winter season. Um, it's an excerpt from a, a journal kept by a Dartmouth student named Knowlton D. Wood. He kept a journal for at least two decades, um, so we have records of all of his mountain trips. Um, he hiked all over New England and the Northeast. Um, beyond that, we don't know a whole lot about him. I, I found him somewhere listed as a librarian later in life, so who knows if that's what he did uh, after graduating from Dartmouth. But uh, he was class of 1932, and this is the record of a Thanksgiving break trek that he took with a couple of other um, Dartmouth Outing Club members. And I think it's just amazing and um, extremely well-written and cool. So here's a, a photo of our hero in some of his extreme winter gear of the time, which is, i.e., anything that he could find. Uh, you see he's got a nice um, anorak there and um, at least glacier glasses for all the glaciers here in New Hampshire. <laughs> this journal hits pretty close to home if you've ever been out hiking in um, kind of bad conditions on your, your earliest remembered unaccompanied by adults <laughs> hike where you may have uh, kind of overthought your capabilities. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a good one. Uh, he did not have any photos particularly in his journals except for one posted here and there. There's this one portrait of him um, in there. But I've put in photos from around the same time period and places that he was hiking. So he starts out uh, at noon of Wednesday the 27th. I slung my pack over my shoulder and went over to the Dartmouth Outing Club office where everything was a hubbub of confusion and many voices speaking all at once. Packs lay strewn all over the room together with cartons of turkeys and boxes of other provisions. Everyone was rushing hurriedly about but with no obvious purpose. Apparently no order could ever come of this chaos. But while I stood there, several men came from different parts of the room and from other rooms and composed a group which, carrying packs, parkas, boxes of provisions, snowshoes, etc., now left the office. 
Soon another group formed and left and then another. And with their departure, there was nothing left in the room except Pete Knight and his pack and me and my pack. Come on, said Pete, let's go. I congratulated myself on having chosen the party with the best car and one upon which reliance could be placed. A dodge of ancient vintage, it was true, but one almost certain to function. At last, all the packs were ready and tied on the running board. Ellis Jump, our trusty leader, was the driver. Fritz Mayer and I filled up the rest of the seat. In back were Pete Knight and Ed Warren. We all wore our parkas to protect ourselves from the winds. We got as far as Lyme, New Hampshire, and the gasket blew. From then on, we ran on two cylinders. It was a dull and dreary day. The air was gloomy and ominous with winter, and the wind drove the cold into us. A cheerless winter night was upon us as we continued to Littleton. When we arrived, we loaded up with water again in preparation for the long climb to Skyline Farm. Considering that it was running on two cylinders, the old Dodge did pretty well to get us up to the cabin. The sunrise next morning was indescribable. It was different from any I'd ever seen before, and its beauty lay not so much in the brilliance of its colors as in the contrast and light and the shade on the mountain ranges. By the time we were ready to start, it was snowing hard. Everyone got in the car, but it wouldn't start. So everyone got back out of the car and pushed. Between the cabin and Littleton, there's a loss of altitude of well over a thousand feet. Otherwise, the, ne the motor never would have started. As it was, we cavorted into Littleton in grand style. The motor was hitting on all cylinders now. We took in water and started out for Pinkham Notch. The car was apparently on its last wheels and Ellis was undoubtedly right in assuming that it could never be coaxed up the grade in Pinkham Notch. The decision was finally made to abandon the car and to climb to the Madison Huts by way of the Valleyway Trail. When we started off up the trail, the snow was falling fast from clouds of a dirty yellow hue. The snow at the beginning of the trail was about a half foot deep, but in the upper reaches, it reached a depth of two feet. This part of the trip was quite enjoyable. Snyder Brook on our left offered some beautiful falls and cascades. Hemlocks and balsams loaded heavily with snow lined our path constantly on every side. We passed Harry Wilson's party, who had spent the night at the huts. They waxed eloquent over the ungodly wind and cold into which we were venturing. About one-eighth mile from the huts, we came in the storm and there we had the full force of the wind. But it was not so bad as we anticipated. So this is uh, Madison Spring Huts in 1929. You can see there's two buildings there. There would actually have been, I think, three by that time. Uh, but there was a little uh, kitchen, dining hut, and then a place for you to sleep, which as you can see here is pretty covered with snow at this point. We found a sorry looking stove inside. It was a once by twice affair with the stovepipe just about rotted away with rust and barely hanging together. We still proved it was possible to light a fire in it. I took off my hiking shoes immediately, which were covered in a good inch of snow and ice on the soles. I laid them on the floor with the soles turned toward the fire. The fire burned steadily for about six hours that evening and for about three hours in the next morning. During all this time, the shoes remained in the same position about two inches from the side of the stove. When I put them on the next morning, there was still a full inch of ice on soles and heels. The dishes were prepared on the oil burner and they were thickly walled with soot on the outside. The soot came off on our hands and subsequently disappeared with the food into our stomachs. But being tired and hungry, we did not mind that. I opened the outer door once to look at the weather the wind snatched the door and pulled at it, pulling me along with it. Then a sudden gust tore it from my grasp and wrenched one of the hinges off. It was all I could do to get the door shut again, 
and after I had succeeded, I had cause enough to remain inside. The wind howled and wailed about us continually, and the snow continued to drift in from the west. I could easily picture the awful psychological reaction on the mind of anyone who should lose his way in a blizzard such as was raging about us. We lost no time in getting to bed. My bunk was directly under the sloping roof of the hut, and about four inches from my face, icicles hung down from the inside. Most of the inside of the roof was thickly coated in frost. The next morning, after having breakfast and washing up the dishes, we started out on the Gulf Side Trail, which runs south from the huts to Mount Washington and Lakes of the Clouds. The lakes are about seven miles from Madison Spring, and the trail is exposed during the whole distance to the full fury of the wind. We all were warmly dressed as, as possible, and there was hardly a particular in which any one of us could have improved his equipment. The wind was stronger than on any day before, and the temperature was much lower. The storm had increased now to blizzard proportions, and the prospect of struggling against it for seven miles was far from alluring. We struck out into the teeth of the storm. The cold was bitter indeed, and when the snow particles struck any portion of my face, they stung like needle points. My shoes were coated with Thursday's ice and snow, and they tended to slip backward as I walked. The visibility was at times no more than 200 feet. We passed the gateway to King Ravine, a sharp cleft in the mountain, leading down below to a vast void of swirling snow and wind. The strong impression the whole affair made on me was one of the relentless energy of the elements we were contending with. Nothing would stop the snow from driving, 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 on and on. Nothing could stop the merciless onslaught of the fierce wind. There was no pity in these elements. If you gave into them, you were gone, and they would continue to rage over your fallen body as though they recognized no worth of life, as though nothing had happened. And then we lost the trail. Look as hard as we could, we could find no cairn anywhere. And so I walked in a circle around our last footsteps in order not to lose them, while the four others went off looking in different directions for a cairn. As I walked about, I could see Ellis disappear in a swirl of snow and then peep. That is an experience I should not care to repeat. Feeling myself slowly freezing as I carefully held lone vigil over the last footsteps of a lost party. On and on came the snow and the wind blew on without pity as the cold crept slowly into my blood. A faint hail now and then from the four who were searching that was all, and then the snow coming in thicker than ever. What a place to be lost. One by one they came back. No one had found the slightest trace of trail. We started back on our trail, and in a few minutes we found a sign indicating Lowe's path to the summit of Mount Adams. We had all had our fill of weather on the ridge, and we agreed that if we tried to make it to the lakes, we should probably all freeze to death. We decided to go over Mount Adams and down the east side, where we would find shelter from the wind and snow. The wind was at our backs now, and we had little difficulty in reaching the summit. We scrambled down through the drifts on the east side. It was a great help to be rid of the full force of the wind, but we now had another element to contend with in the form of deep snow drifts. In places, they were well over 10 feet deep in the scrub growth and between rocks of considerable height. Ellis took out his marching compass to get his direction as we were now going without a trail. We were not paying much attention to him and he did not tell us until afterward that the alcohol in his compass was frozen solid and it was of course of no use. The worst part of our trip was over now but we still had to get down through the drifts to Pinkham Notch. From the summit of Adams to the beginning of the Madison Gulf Trail is less than a mile. According to Ellis, it took us two and a half hours to do that. Darkness came as we approached the Glen House and we had to travel by flashlight. 
The storm blew over and the stars came out bright by the time we reached the Pink of Notch Road. Three miles from the Glen to Pink of Notch camps was child's play compared with what we had been through previously. At Pink of Notch, we were royally welcomed by Sam Allen and his party, who became, because of the storm, had also been unable to carry out their scheduled program. In ascertaining the extent to which I had frozen up during the day, I found that all my toes and fingers had gone and both wrists were badly frostbitten. As were also my nose, both cheeks, my chin, and under my lip. Our party had encountered, encountered weather of the severity of which the other party had no comprehension. Tired as we were, we soon made good use of the comfortable bunks and blankets. And that's Knowlton, and whew, that one gives me chills every time. <laughs> so those are uh, three fantastic examples um, of just some of the journals and diaries that we have in our collections. We have many, many more um, all among all the other hundreds of photographs and maps and um, organizational records, um, memorabilia, all the kind of great archival stuff. But these direct primary source voices from the past, I think, are definitely a highlight of what we have. Um, so that's all I've got. Um, anybody have questions? I need a cup of tea to warm up after that, Becky. <laughs> Me too. That was terrifying. Oh my gosh. Right? Oh, <laughs> you know, that last one. <laughs> All right. Um, so we have our first question, Becky. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how hiking experiences differed between women and men in the time period you covered? Were there differences between the 1910s and the 1920s? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, by the 1910s, especially among AMC groups, um, the sexes were, were pretty much considered equal. Um, there were a lot of women going out, um, usually with larger parties, although there were specific women who went out just with other um, women and did trips like this as well. So, and I would say, you know, from the 1910s up to 1920, you started to see um, the clothing changed, they started to lose the long skirts that women were often expected to wear, so that gave them a lot more freedom and um, their ability to climb and not get tangled in the Krumholz that is ubiquitous around this area. Um, but there was definitely an AMC, we had this, uh, an ethic of um, kind of equality. Women were thought to be able to do these 140 mile hikes just as well as the men were. So it's, um, it's, and it's pretty impressive. There were some pretty amazing uh, women members in our ranks. Thank you, Becky. Um, our second question, uh, at what point did AMC start to serve meals? Oh, um, well, let's see, in the huts, uh, I think our first hired caretaker at Madison Spring Hut, which was uh, the first hut, was in 1906. And he, at first, I think he was just there to kind of supervise the crowds that were starting to show up. But very quickly, we realized we could offer some meal prep. You were still told to maybe bring some of your own food, um, but they did offer meals at that time. Although all of our, our, um, our volunteer managed camps and lodges and cabins serve meals all, all from the very beginning from their founding dates so like Three Mile Island Camp out on Winnipesaukee was serving meals from 1900 onward. All right anybody else have any questions you can use the chat. You can also add any comments if you like. Yeah um, that's always fun to see. <clears throat> I loved, how, uh, Becky, how you paired the photos for that last story. That was, that really gave the feeling. I don't, I, for me, I wouldn't know the, the accuracy of the locations, but I felt like I was there with them. So that was, yeah. that was great. Yeah, I was glad that we had 
shots from around that time period up on the northern part of the range too because you really can't get a sense of the terrain and how open and exposed all of that is um, unless you've been up there and I've never been up that side in the winter time but it's you know you hear about how fierce it is. <laughs> What's the percentage of the the journals that you have in the collection that do have photographs? I mean is that a common thing or not so common? Um, it's actually surprisingly common. I would say it's probably almost 50-50. There's a lot of these, um, a lot of the ones that we have aren't so much journals as just somebody's personal log book. Mm -hmm. And they would often, we have a few that are in these, um, the little post binders. Uh, and they have, it was actually like printed out trip log uh, things that you could buy and keep adding into the journal. So it has everything from, you know, where you hiked and your mileage. Um, notes about the weather and then you can write in little notes added about your trip and then this this person that we have that, that made these pasted in cut out map sections and like traced their route on them and then pasted in photographs on top of that so it's this whole like you know multi-dimensional oh. scrapbook kind of a thing <laughs> it's artsy <laughs> yeah yeah it's great all right, looks like we have some more questions. Um, how many journals and logbooks do you have and what is the range of dates? Oh, let's see. I would say we probably have um, maybe about a dozen to 15 different um, journals and diaries. Uh, logbooks, we have dozens and dozens, uh, mostly from the huts when, when the, um, when the hut log books kind of age out or get too fragile to stay up in the huts, they come down to us. So we have the very first log book from Madison Spring Hut from 1889. Um, and then there's kind of a gap because there was a fire there. And then we have tons and tons of them from like Lakes of the Clouds Hut from the early 1900s. So there's a lot more of those, but people's personal journals and diaries, I would say there's about a dozen. Um, and they date from, I think the earliest one we have is 1896. And then they go up to maybe about the 1940s or very early 50s. All right, so a question that kind of goes along with that. Are you still receiving contemporary journals? Um, I haven't in a while, but uh, yeah, I do have people that send them to me every every once in a blue moon, and we definitely collect them. I know that um, now that so much stuff is digital too, um, those probably exist, and I would happily collect born digital journals and diaries also. Awesome, um, so this question from Dale. Uh, I forgot that Carter Notch was first on the shore of one of the lakes. When was it moved higher? It's oh, called yeah. bring water up that incline in the winter from the hole cut through the ice which is covered by a board to present it prevent it from refreezing yeah yeah so the um the cabin that they stayed in was there from sometime in the early 1900s up to 1914 when the new stone hut on um, so the the um the old cabin would have been just where the 19 mile brook trail pops out at the first pond. There's a, there's a trace of a little clearing there that you can actually detect if you're hiking in the area. Um, but the hut, the, the stone hut that exists today was built uh, and opened in 1915 over on the opposite side of the farther lake. So it, it is considerably higher up. The one that the, uh, the old cabin was right there on the shore of the lake. So it wasn't quite such a slog to um, carry water up, which, yeah, I know how that is. <laughs> awesome. Um, so another question, um, was Grace Harishoff hiking with family members? What relationship did she have with the other hikers? Yeah, no, so she was unrelated to anyone else uh, in the party. So she was there on her own. Um, I presume she was friends with everybody there. Um, I haven't actually looked deeply into the other members of that party to see if there was anybody else from her 
area because oftentimes you'll find these little networks of you know all the Rhode Island people would go on these trips together um, but yeah she as far as I know was not um, was not related to anybody else in that group All right. Yeah, this is a good question. Um, I was thinking this the same. Uh, were people aware of the dangers of hypothermia, not enough food for snacks, not hydrated? Were there a lot of casualties? That is a really good question. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. That, I mean, people talk often about just drinking from streams, which seemed to be the norm at that time. So, um, but as far as you know, hydration and our, I know modern people have, modern hikers have a fixation on having enough water. <laughs> I certainly do. Um, but back then, yeah, there's, I've actually read of um, people either sucking on small pebbles or uh, lemon wedges to, to actually suppress their own thirst, which seems like a terrible idea. <laughs> to me. So I, yeah, I don't, I don't know if they really thought as much about hydration. Um, food energy, that seems to be on folks' minds all the time. They, you know, even in the earliest kind of guides to camping and hiking, there's a lot of uh, focus on having lots of calories and, you know, go ahead and eat lots of high calorie foods and fatty foods. Um, you know, bringing hardtack along. The way to eat hardtack is to soak it in water and then fry it in bacon fat. <laughs> so you're getting really healthy amounts of fat <laughs> when you're out hiking and camping with these folks. So I think they, I think they were a little more um, keyed into like the, their caloric needs out on the trails. But yeah, the water thing always kind of makes me wonder too. Um, hypothermia, yeah. Um, Folks, I think, were definitely kind of had that in mind. Some of the earliest casualties in the White Mountains had to do with hypothermia. There was one famous um, double casualty on Mount Washington in 1900 when two hikers from New York were hiking up the Crawford Path to meet the AMC for a field meeting on the summit of Mount Washington, and they died of exposure. Uh, and that's why Lakes of the Clouds Hut was actually built where it was built, because these two men perished right near that spot. So, um, yeah, even back in that time, exposure and hypothermia were huge, huge concerns. Um, but with the gear that they had, I mean, it was, yeah, a totally different story um, back then. Okay. Um, yep, Adam just commented that William Pickering in his guide to hiking the presidential range suggested drinking a very large amount of water before setting out. Uh, yes, yeah, the prehydration technique. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yep. All right, well, that looks like it for questions right now. Well, thank you, Becky. This has been such a great um, talk. I really, I learned a lot and I really enjoy those stories. I, I would love, oh boy, it makes you want to like, um, I don't know, I, I want to experience more of the stories. It seems, I, you know, it's, I, I want to, I want to know what happened to the car, you know, did they, you know, like, <laughs> like the end of the stories kind of thing. So yeah. thank you so much for sharing those, those um, snapshots because they're just great. Yeah. My pleasure. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm, I only transcribe little pieces of all of these. It's always a work in progress to, to keep reading. I wish I had a clone who could just sit and read <laughs> all of these things all day. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, thank you everybody for coming this evening. We're so glad you were here. Um, Definitely, um, thanks to Becky. Uh, she's worked with the museum for so, on so many exhibits and on um, ideas for how to keep these stories alive. Um, and we're really, really grateful for that. Um, do come back um, next month to um, hear Dave Kovatsky and, and his talk, um, which you'll see in our um, publications, our, our publicity. And um, if you'd like to become a member of the museum, you're certainly welcome to join the group. We'd love to have you. Um, but thanks for being here, everybody. Stay well, and we'll see you very soon.